And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Wendy Rose Williams, who was a previous guest that talked about encountering angels and her soul group during her near-death experience. Today, she returns to talk about connecting with your guides, how to work and identify soulmates and soul contracts. Wendy, thanks for coming back and welcome. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jeff. Thank you for having me back. So during your near-death experience, was that the very first time you encountered angels and your soul group? It really was. I'd had some experiences as a child, but I didn't know what to make of them. So when I had the near-death experiences, there were actually two uh, during the same week back in 1997 when I was pregnant with my youngest daughter. And that really was the first time. And the angels saved my life because I was home alone. And what ended up happening was my fundus, which is the top of the uterus, and it's an aorta, it burst. And I was unconscious on the floor when I heard this male voice just insistently saying, Wendy, Wendy, you've got to wake up and call for help. And that was such a amazing, shocking experience. It really blew my belief system wide open because I'm laying on the floor in the bathroom and I just look up and the room is lit up with angels. And they helped me get to the phone. They helped me call for help. My husband picked me up incredibly quickly from work. He worked five minutes away and he had the car and got me to got me to the physician's office, which was located at the hospital. And it just it just went from there. So I was very fortunate. Was the male voice an angel or was that a member of your soul group? It was an angel. When I looked up in my bath, I'm laying on the floor on my side. So it was kind of an odd view. And I looked up and the bathroom was lit up with these huge beings of light. They were like seven or nine foot tall. And there were uh, three or four of them. And I later realized that that voice that I heard was Archangel Michael. Hmm. And forever grateful. He very specific. Wendy, wake up, call for help. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Very specific. Were the other angels archangels or were they like lower angels? I don't know. It's a great question, Jeff. And I don't know. I just knew they were angels and I heard only Michael. It just, it felt like the group was there to encompass me and help me physically get to the phone. Ooh because I couldn't walk. So what they said was, you just have to be willing to try. Because that was the first thing I said to them was, I can't walk. I'm not sure I can get to the phone. And when they said, you just have to be willing to try, I got up on my hands and knees. And then it was like being lifted uh, the short distance to the landline phone that was in the master bedroom. So after that experience, when was the next time in your life that the angels appeared? It was a few days later. I was in the hospital for about a week and just transfusing unit after unit after unit uh, for about three days. And they kept uh, measuring my hematocrit, of course, and many other things to see how I was doing. And my doctor, my own OBGYN was attending me. And he let me know that I was officially uh, bleeding out because they just could not get enough blood transfused based on what I was losing. And I agreed at that point to surgery. So I knew surgery was going to be the next day. I knew it was going to be my own OB and a second uh, OBGYN from his practice. And when I tried that night after dinner to just relax and picture the best outcome The minute I did that, I popped right out of my body and I floated up above my body and I went out through the ceiling of the hospital. I looked back at myself and I was shocked how detached I was because it's like, ah, she'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why am I referring to myself in the third person? But I was really in pure soul form and just wanted to go up to the light. That was much more interesting than me than being in that much pain and so much worry and anxiety in my my body so i went i went up and up and up 
and I had a funny thought, oh, please don't make me walk through a tunnel. I don't think I have enough energy to do it. And the minute I thought that this beautiful escalator, this pristine escalator just for me appeared and I took that up to the light. And the moment I got up to the top of the escalator, there was this welcoming committee for me. And that's where my soul group was in addition to those angels, the same angels from my, my bathroom a few days uh, earlier, including Michael, who again was a spokesperson. But all my grandparents were there, all four of them. There were about 20 beings of light gave me this huge hug and oh my gosh, to feel that unconditional love and true healing and no judgment. I just wanted to stay forever. It's like, yay, I'm home. This is it. And what Michael said was, you're welcome to stay. Welcome home. We're so glad you're here. You haven't done anything wrong. You're welcome to stay. But if you want to go back, you're going to have to decide quickly. So here's what I can tell you. I can tell you three things. When you go ahead, if you choose to return, have the surgery tomorrow, it will be successful. You will regain your health, number one. Number two, your baby will be born healthy. So those were two huge pieces of information. And the third thing he said was, I also need you to know life is going to be very difficult, likely for many years, because you are not on your life path. So I, I'm horrified to hear that. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm 36 years old. I want to be doing the right thing. What am I not doing? What, what am I missing? So I looked at him and he just shook his head. He wasn't going to say anymore. So I'm looking around at the whole group thinking, come on, there's 20 of them here. Somebody's got to be a chatty Kathy, nobody would say anything. They, they just started getting silly and they're putting duct tape over their mouths. They're like throwing away the key. <laughs> mm. So I realized I'm just going to be privileged to have the information that I have, privileged that I had this experience. And he asked me then, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I choose to go back. Because the minute he asked me that, I just saw my toddler's face because we also had an 18 month old. And here I knew I'm gonna have a successful surgery and my new baby is gonna be born healthy. So I said, I'm going back for my children. So they just gave me another huge group hug. That time I caught on, it wasn't only unconditional love, it was a lot of energy because I was flatter than a pancake from having been bleeding out for days. I don't think I would have survived the surgery. So I was so grateful to get that, that energy. And then they all like turn into cheerleaders as they put me back down on the escalator to go back in my body. And they're like, you can do it. Get back in there. You know, we're so proud of you. We're always going to be with you. And that changed things for me because I'd never felt that sort of support. I'd never felt I could connect like that or had that wisdom and love available to me. So it was, it was a big deal. And, and I went back and everything the angel said was true. Between the first experience and the, and the second one, was there ever any period in your mind of doubt, like what happened? And if so, what erased that doubt? Meaning between the two near-death experiences? Well, be, you know, after your first one and or your second one, was there any doubt like, what did I just see? Was that really angels? And, and No, honestly, there was not. And yeah. that surprised me because who I was at that moment, I was a working mother, a very busy working mother. I had, I was a Christian, but pretty casual about it. And I just did not have any spiritual beliefs or practices to speak of, but there was no doubt in my mind that it was the most real of real experiences and that I had the good fortune to be shown a deeper truth that we all have that support and love available to us. We just need to ask and you don't have to have a near-death experience to do it. Just be willing to ask, can I get some help here? Can I get some assistance? Can I get some wisdom? We've got to ask for that help from our guides. They're not going to interfere with their free will. What's the best way to ask? Simply to, 
you can do it any way that feels comfortable and natural for you. You can close your eyes for two minutes and just uh, clear your energy and uh, take a couple breaths and just, just ask. You can meditate, you can pray, uh, you can be doing it when you're in this beautiful uh, walk out in nature, whatever is natural to you, but we just have to be willing to ask. Have you discovered your life path? And if so, what is it? Yes, I have in a lot of different, a lot of different ways. Uh, I believe my life path is to help others with their spiritual awakening, because I've had so many experiences in that area since I began consciously uh, waking up first via the NDE, which I then kind of put in a box for quite a long time because I didn't know what to do with it. And that was back in 97, but then I started to really uh, explore and become a spiritual speak, uh, seeker in 2010. And so the last last uh, 12 years or so. So that's an important part of my path. Um, I do that via um, sessions with clients. I do that just helping people just take, can be the conversation in the grocery store. And I can hear my guides say, you know, tell the person this. Because it, it, it could just be the simplest thing, just to encourage them. You know, it's not like I'm I'm doing readings. I'm not a psychic medium, but it just that that simple help um, or a positive comment from someone that's very it's very guided and it's just what they need. Mm. Uh, it's the same thing with with the writing that I do. It comes very much from uh, my guides and and I, it's my privilege to write for them because I'm I'm the one with the computer. I'm the one with the hands. <laughs> Do we all have guides? It's just that most of us don't know how to contact them. I believe, yes. I believe uh, I believe we're eternal souls and we choose to incarnate many times, many places, earth, other planets, other dimensions. It's my personal belief. We've got, again, it's a free will choice. And I believe we all have guides because guess what? It's hard. We do this pre-life planning. Uh, we might set up uh, different soul contracts, choose to meet certain soulmates that are going to help us with what we're wanting to work on as lessons and to progress as that eternal soul. And doesn't it make perfect sense that we'd have guidance in doing that both on the other side before we incarnate, helping us plan, and then helping us once we're here? I mean, I see it as you know, the most fabulous mentor or coach ever. Uh, I believe, yes, we all have guides, but in Western society, we're not taught that. That's, that's more of a, of, a, of a Buddhist belief or, you know, it depends what culture you're from, whether people believe in spirit guides uh, or what beliefs they choose to have. Do we choose our guides or are they assigned to us? I think it's some of both. I think... Uh, personally, let me just ask my guide set right now. Okay. What they're saying is when we're younger, newer souls, and we haven't incarnated many times in a body, our guides are more chosen for us because we're not really capable of making a great choice. So they're more chosen. It's like, okay, this, this is going to be your coach. <laughs> but now when we've incarnated many times and we're more experienced souls, uh, simply meaning more times um, in a body and have had more experiences, we're more capable. And then we're at the point where, oh, hmm, I know, I know I work really well with this guide, or I think I would work really well with this guide, or this guide is a specialist in forgiveness. And I know that's a big thing I want to work on this lifetime. So I'm going to create a lot of experiences where things feel pretty unforgivable to me, because how else am I going to practice really learning and mastering forgiveness if I don't have those sorts of experiences? So I think it's a combination, Jeff. I think it evolves along the way. Do you think that the guide that is present with us from birth stays our entire life, or do we even change guides? I believe we do have a guide that stays with us from birth, but I believe additional guides can come in. Uh, what I find as I do uh, facilitate past life regression sessions for people is it seems to fall into two camps. 
Some people have this amazing guide their whole life. That's their generalist guide. And if that guide doesn't know something or they need particular help with something that's outside that guide's domain or their scope or specialty, the guide goes and gets more information in that area and brings it to the person that they're working with. Whereas other people have multiple guides directly coming to them because I know I had some new guides come in when I started writing and publishing. Uh, that was the first time that I met some new guides that helped me with that because that was a big endeavor and I had no idea what I was doing and I was self-publishing. So there was not only the, the write the book and get the right content, but how do you do all the other pieces of get it edited and you know get the beta readers and and the, the cover and where do I publish it and just all the all the mechanics of it that are important. Do you think that guides were once human like us that evolved to the guide level or or are they completely different beings from us? There's both. I have met personally my own um, both types because our guides might be ancestors, for instance. You may have a lovely grandmother, grandparent, aunt, uncle, parent, uh, you know, whatever family member that, that where there was a blood relation, it's an ancestor. They also can be from many generations ago and you don't remember or you didn't meet them in this lifetime, like my paternal grandparents, my dad's parents. I never met them. They died before I was born, but they are some of my guides. So um, people have a combination of guides who were once human or had other types of incarnations and guides who have never incarnated. Angels, for instance, have never um, incarnated uh, on the earth plane. So there's a combination. I see both. Could a guide be a member of our soul group? Yes, a guide can be a member of our soul group because I don't believe we incarnate with every member of our soul group every time. We just, we need more variety than that. And they've got all their own things they're working on. So we might come in if we're fortunate with a couple members of our soul group and also soul groups can be different sizes. Uh, so yes, there could be someone uh, like that for instance, uh, there may be someone from your soul group who is your parent. And just through that, that parent-child role, uh, they, are, they are a guide. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to go beautifully. Uh, some of our best teaching comes from what's called a, a negative teacher, uh, where we learn what not to do, and we learn what doesn't work for us. And we have to uh, again, forgive. We've got to establish good boundaries. We've got to get our own uh, self-confidence uh, and everything uh, going well um, from that, you know, from that relationship, because it may have been a very um, judgmental or negative Nelly uh, type of parent. Still, still a soul group member. When someone's in contact with their guides themselves do they hear their guides or do they see signs from their guides yes it can come in so many different ways because we have all our psychic abilities and we tend to have one or two of them that are that are stronger so for instance some people are quite clairvoyant so yes they might physically see uh, you know, out of the corner of their eye, it's like, oh my goodness, what, what, I just saw this big flash of white, you know, what was that? Or a certain color or, or whatever it was. Other people are very clear audience. Uh, that's my gift. I hear um, my guides and spirit very, very well. And I trust the accuracy of what, what I'm hearing, because that's the next step. It's not just taking this information in, it's, is this valid? Is this correct for me? Do I feel it in my heart or is it making me nervous or, or not, not feel right? It's not something I choose to act on. Uh, so, and other people sense, they know, they feel, a few people smell or taste and just, there, there's so many different ways that information can come to us. And definitely those beautiful signs and synchronicities some people, when they're asking for help from their guides, they just see white feathers everywhere. 
um, I went through an interesting period where I was just um, doing a lot of driving. This was pre-COVID. And a lot of times it was I'd be going to places where it was hard to find public parking. So I would just ask my guides, would you be so kind? I know this is a little thing, mm. but would you be so kind as to help me find a good parking space, uh, you know, near, near to that location? Because I was having mobility problems at that time also. So it was hard to walk far. And I can't tell you how many great parking spots I found, but Jeff, they would always, as I'd pulling in, I'd be like, what is that? I see something on the ground and I would carefully look, um, you know, maybe partly pull in and look and I'd find a feather or a coin mm. every single time. It's like, wow, you really are helping me with divine parking here. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that because I've been thinking lately that when I'm going to park, I need to, I need to say something like, "Okay, angels or guides, help me find a great parking spot." So yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned that. People that's... say the parking angels, and just yeah. yeah, just say I'd so appreciate. You know, would that be possible? Could you help me with it? And it's just it's just a, a wonderful little way to ask for help, just kind of surrender, and then make sure you take a lot of joy in it. Just have a lot of fun with it, and really thank them. And that's that cycle of ask, receive, and thank. And I feel like it, it just raises our vibration and we just expect good things and are able to help uh, share that with others because our vibration just goes higher and higher. You mentioned that you may not trust the information coming from your guide. So is it possible that you're just not understanding the information coming from your guide? Absolutely. Or- I uh, mean, that, I, I was going to say, I don't, I can't see how your guide would be giving you wrong information. Sometimes we don't have, um, we, we're just not understanding, as you said. So it can be something that's um, just, we need more clarity on. So you just need to ask more questions and just, just keep going with that and keep looking for more signs to know that you're understanding the information. And also sometimes we're told things that are hard to hear and we don't like them. Hmm. But just because we don't like the information doesn't mean it's not correct. I was shown a lot of signs, um, give you an example, for about six months uh, before I was laid off from a job that I really enjoyed, really liked, depended on. I'd been there almost 10 years. I had planned to retire from there but I started having dreams. I started hearing my guides say, you need to get ready. You need to start to pack your things up here. You need to start to prepare because it's going to be time for a big change. And I'm like, Oh no, I no, (laughs) I don't want a big change. (laughs) I just, I really, I really like and depend on this job. And it took, um, two different spiritual teachers and healers to say to me, uh, Wendy, do you know you're in resistance and that your job is likely to be going away? So are you preparing well? And can we help you get on board with that? Because it's going to happen. So that that's an example of where we can block information that's correct and accurate, but we don't like it. <laughs> How does one differentiate between their own thoughts versus this is a message from a guide? That is a fantastic question. Some of the ways I do that is I can tell because when I'm specifically meditating or auto writing to get a message from my guide, the information comes, or if I'm muscle testing to do it is another way I communicate with my guides. Uh, The information comes so quickly I know that's not my left brain ego because it can't, it can't react that quickly. So it's like, you barely ask the question and it's like, oh my goodness, there's the answer. There's the flash of inspiration, intuition, new information. Um, And it also, it, it makes you feel good in your heart versus you're not feeling like, ugh, this elevator just dropped because we can get so caught up in our left brain and our ego. And I see that as being where fear lives. So that's a good question is, does it feel like love? 
does it feel uplifting and calming and like it's expansion or does it feel like this contraction it's like ugh. <laughs> ego versus versus our soul and spirit and guides all right you mentioned soulmates earlier and how do you define a soulmate is it something like what i would think pop culture or the general culture thinks like it's just this perfect romantic partner or is it something much more? I think pop culture is doing us a big disservice. They've taken a little tiny piece of what a soulmate can make, uh, can be and have made it into a big uh, hurrah. Uh, I see a soulmate as someone that we travel with many times. It's someone that's in a soul group with us where we may have some common objectives and be working on some of the same lessons together, perhaps, uh, or, but it's just, it's simply someone that we travel with, incarnate with many, many times. Soulmates can be uh, romantic or, but most of them are platonic. Most of them are, they're, they're like those best friends. They're those wonderful uh, supporters. It's that like neighbor that just always has a smile and can't do enough for you and is out there snow plowing your driveway before you even get up in the morning. It's, it's that wonderful boss that was just such a fantastic mentor and really cared about you and helped you uh, time and time again. Uh, soulmates can also be the most difficult relationships we've got because they can agree to play uh, those negative teacher roles because that's what we need. We need the grind. We need that, um, what are, is it carbon that eventually as it grinds and grinds eventually becomes a diamond? And sometimes we just need that tough grind to uh, be able to level up and realize I can do better, I can choose better than to constantly be uh, fighting with this person, to be angry with this person, to uh, you know just, just be in that sort of a relationship. Uh, Ex-spouses, former spouses are often uh, soulmates where we had some uh, tougher, tougher lessons or soul contracts together. And either it was complete, so it was time to part, or perhaps we didn't master it. Do you believe that most of the people we encounter in our life, we already planned it before coming here? It depends how big uh, your, your world is. If you, um, let's say you meet I'm totally making up numbers, 500 to 1,000 people in your, in your whole lifetime. Perhaps you have encountered uh, most, if not all of them before. But if you're someone that's got a, a, bigger, a bigger network because you're meant to, and you meet and interact with 10 or 20,000 people during your entire lifetime, perhaps not. So it's an intriguing question. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't really thought about that before. What's the difference between a soul mate and a twin flame? I see a twin flame as being a specific type of soul mate that some souls have. Not, I don't believe everyone has a twin flame. I see it as the other half of your soul where you've chosen at a certain point in your incarnation, I'm now going to split off and we're going to go off and have some very different experiences because we'll learn more that way. So we incarnate with just a portion of our energy so we can go off and each do our own thing. And then at a certain point, we choose, it might be on the other side at home or it might be on earth. We choose to have reunion. I see the twin flame journey as being learning how to become complete in yourself because we're not damaged we're not incomplete this is this was a soul choice to make to do that i don't believe in jerry Maguire. you complete me uh, we're not broken we're not meant to be codependent mm. but as we become complete in ourself and if we've done our work we can have a twin flame reunion that's amazing that's magical that creates so much light 
it's I see it as a, as a strategy of spirit. It's a strategy that hasn't worked very well because most of the twin flames actually end up being initially very attracted and then they repel because it's like this mirror being held up to you of the things you least like about yourself. Hmm. So um, it's, it's, it's hard to have, you know, done enough work to say, I'm going to work through this and, and to be able to um, have that reunion or uh, twin flames might meet and one or both are already married. And obviously we want to honor those commitments. It's, it's not a journey about, Oh, I've met the better half of me. <laughs> no, no. It's fascinating to think about because if we have our own ego to ourselves, and then if you met a person that has their own ego, you know, and their own complete identity, but you both are part of the same soul. It's also marvelously complex. <laughs> Every wonderful question you ask makes me think of 10 more questions. <laughs> So what is a twin ray soulmate? I see a twin ray as being the other half of our soul when we are galactic beings, meaning not on earth. So some souls choose to incarnate many times on other planets and earth might be uh, an unusual place for them to incarnate. So Take everything I just said regarding twin flames, but think think galactic, think mm. other planets. What do you know about star seeds? I know I think of star seeds as uh, amazing souls who have chosen to incarnate both on other planets. Other planets other than Earth are typically their planet of origin, meaning it's the first place they ever incarnated, and they've then incarnated in whatever whichever planets and then are choosing to have a life on earth and there's also hybrid souls uh, which are star seeds that have incarnated many times on other planets and also on earth uh, i i'm one of those uh, my guides have told me i've uh, incarnated about half the time on other planets and then uh, started coming to to earth uh, which I whine about sometimes. I'll be mm. honest. I can find it hard. Um, star seeds can find life on Earth very difficult, so they may need additional support uh, from their their guides. Um, they may choose to um, stay at home a long time after lives on Earth or to go to some other planets. I also just met a client uh, last week where she was living. She's here on Earth. We do a session, we discover not only a parallel life, but that she's living that parallel simultaneous life now, and it's in a utopia. Hmm. So she does that, and she's now aware of the two, and she's able to, in an appropriate way, just go there and relax and just ask, can I meditate and go and spend some conscious time there? Because I'm 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 worn out. I'm frustrated. I'm tired of you know what's going on here in my life and Earth. So I want to go spend a little time in that other uh, utopia type life where people can do the same thing and say, please take me to a healing temple. As you're going to sleep at night, just ask for help. Ask for healing. Sleep is meant to be restful and restorative, and it's often not because we've got ourselves so overly busy. Um, and so many interruptions of, you know, this, this phone and this social media and just scheduled over scheduled. So we need to just wind it down to get that rest and um, healing at night. When you said you did a session with her, did she have a past life regression with you? Exactly. Exactly. I facilitated the session for her and just we, we found this amazing uh, parallel life, another life happening now, because we have plenty of energy where we can be in more than one body at a time. But it was just so amazing to find it was a utopian um, type of life. And also during past life regressions, when people are, again, feeling just worn out, frazzled, exhausted, 
anxious, depressed, in pain, whatever it might be, we can also look for uh, really positive um, past lives and bring that energy to now. And they just can feel better now. Um, when we find that rest life, that relaxation life, or their favorite past life, that sort of thing. Um, I have a lot of fun with some of my favorite past lives, just thinking about those, asking my guides to tell me more about them because they're very different than the life I live now. I don't want to live them again, mm. but there were just, you know, such, such neat experiences in them uh, mm. that I, you know, can, you can bring that forward to your energy now because it's, it's all, <laughs> it's all the same soul. Do you use QHHT or what techniques do you use? Yes. Um, I trained first with a wonderful gentleman named Chris Turner in the UK, and he had trained with Dolores Cannon, who created the quantum healing hypnotherapy technique. So Chris then created regression healing, was inspired by QHHT. So that was the first modality I learned for past life regression um, was, was derived from QHHT with, with one of Dolores's first degree students. Then I trained with Dr. Brian Weiss, uh, for a week at the Omega Institute out in um, upstate New York. And that was that was fantastic experience. And then I trained with one of Dr. Michael Newton's uh, first degree students, um, Karen Wells, and she had been one of the original uh, students of his and original trainers for the Newton Institute. And you just you just keep um, compiling in the best possible way because every, every person's different, every person. I mean, we plan every session mm -hmm. um, via a phone appointment and email, but then you've got to, got to go with the flow of what's coming up at that time. So mm -hmm. it's just wonderful tools in the toolbox. And my guides uh, come in during the entire session because I'm inviting them in from the moment I know I'm going to work with someone. I'm asking our higher selves and our guides to start working together on that client's behalf. And it's really neat because sometimes the session might not be held for two or three weeks or whatever time period due to scheduling. And that's a good thing because it gives the um, guides some time to start uh, making things happen. And they resolve some of the things sometimes ahead, um, which is really neat. And the person will say, I can't believe it, but you know, since we talked and since I sent you those questions, this is no longer an issue. And it's like, yay. <laughs> So do most people search you out because they have a problem in this life and they're hoping that they'll discover something in the past life that will help resolve it? Or are they just curious about past lives or what? It's a combination. Some people are very focused and we need to shift and see what we can do to resolve pain, anxiety, depression, uh, disease, uh, troubling relationships, whatever might be going on that, that's, that's challenging for them. So that certainly is a big group of people who are seeking a healing session of this type. Uh, other people are just lit up and excited and want to learn more about their past lives, want to know more about spirituality, because I'm also a certified spiritual teacher and a Reiki master energy healer. So they just want to start to look at, well, what's this really interesting dream I have? And oh my gosh, could, is time travel really possible? What does that mean? Are we talking astral travel, remote viewing? Are we talking with a body? You know, they just have some really intriguing questions and they want to get more information. So we're tuning into and helping them communicate with their higher self and their guides which is very empowering for people. Um, certainly, I, I share impressions and in, in what I'm what I'm hearing from my guides and their guides with their permission. I share that, but I'm very careful to always check with them first. What impressions, if any, are they getting? Because, as I said, you want it to be empowering. Do a lot of your sessions end up in in between lives, and you start discussing soul contracts? Yes. Uh, even the, I do, I facilitate either two and a half hour or four hour sessions. So it's a good, it's a good amount of time. And even in the two and a half hour session, we do um, pass on from the last day in a past life and go up into pure soul form. 
uh, similar to an NDE, but without the drama and the trauma of what led to the NDE. And we go up to the light and I call in a guide or a greeter for that person and we debrief anything more they want to tell us about the past life or past lives we viewed. They may want to tell us about another one because they know what we're working on. I, I print out the list of questions and requests the person has. And of course, <laughs> guides don't need that, but I still think it helps organize. I just lay it out on my desk as my process before the session starts. And I'm asking the guides to help with what I've laid out there as the questions. And they assist with that. They make sure that the person now has a good connection with their guide, because that's one of the things we do during session two is I help them get connected if they're not already and they receive a gift from their guide to help them in their life today. And they receive a message from their guide. And usually the person is able to speak the message themselves. Um, but sometimes occasionally I'll need to, to help them with that. And we also ask if any additional healing is possible because we start the session in a healing temple. And But now that we're up with the light, we're in that between lives state, uh, we are able to... Um, go to the place of all knowledge. That is the main place where we go during the past life regression sessions. And that's where we get the answers to the important questions they've posed that haven't already been answered. Uh, and then there's a separate type of session that is a between lives session, which was inspired by Dr. Michael Newton's Life Between Lives, where we're really getting into detail. What was it like in your mother's womb in this lifetime, why did you choose these parents? Why did you choose the body and the brain that you have? Why did you choose the exact moment, um, time and place of your birth? Because that determines your astrology um, and your numerology, which have big impacts on your life too. Uh, so yes, uh, we do, we do uh, spend some time up with the light. At what point do you think a spirit enters a body in the mother's womb, like immediately on conception or two weeks, six weeks? All over the map. Um, what I have heard from uh, most uh, people that I've worked with and a, a better source who's got a bigger database on that answer is Dr. Michael Newton in Journey of Souls because 200 therapists, thousands of sessions worldwide and the average seems to be around three to five months of when the soul um, is permanently joining in with that, that little fetus during the gestation. And they may go in and out, particularly when the mother is sleeping. Um, the soul may still be uh, back up with the light, still doing some planning um, for that lifetime or doing some recreation or doing whatever they want and need to do. Um, so that was that was the average. I myself, when I did my first Life Between Lives, the therapist asked me that question. And what my higher self answered was that I came in permanently at three months gestation and I said that was early, but I did it because I had to fit big energy into a smaller body. And I chose a body with severe scoliosis. So I've got uh, major curvature of the spine and my soul was like, how do I fit in there? How do I get comfortable? How do I not have so much pain that I can't function? Um, another person that I facilitated that type of a, a session for, he, his higher self said, oh, he came in kind of late. He came in for the first time at around seven months gestation. And we both burst out laughing because I tend to be early for appointments in life. And he tends to come in late. <laughs> like, oh, my goodness. It was already since right when we joined in the womb i thought that was just very very we both thought that was amusing <laughs> but three to five months seems to be the quote average of gestation but it can it can vary are there any things that you learned from your clients that you didn't already know from your general spiritual knowledge 
Oh my gosh. I learn from, I am blessed to learn from clients each and every session. I'm always learning new things, which I love. It just keeps it so fun and so interesting because we're all so unique as, as souls and we have different journeys and different paths and different experiences and different abilities So that's another big thing that I love when we're able to do during session is we're not just releasing the hard stuff, that past life energy that's holding people back because it's having too much of an impact and we can find the lifetime of origin and release it, but we can find past abilities and knowledge. I've worked with people who've been in all types of different mystery schools or have worked in the library at Alexandria or who have amazing, interesting jobs at home, and they'll learn what that job is. Um, So there's always um, neat, neat things coming up. I've never seen a session that I could predict. I don't want to be able to predict them. They always have some neat surprises in it, because you just want to keep that open heart and be really there with what that person is experiencing and then bring in uh, the best assistance that you can for it. Have you seen any patterns in people? Like, for example, people who in this time in their life are afraid of, you know, swimming or the water, like, okay, those people usually, you know, they have drowned up falling off a boat or something in a previous life. Yes. Yes. There's lots of fears and phobias And it might be from this lifetime. And it could have happened when we were very young and we don't really remember uh, that that big barking dog that really bared its teeth at us. And for the rest of our lifetime, we're just kind of not comfortable around big dogs. Um, You know, it may have happened when we were one year old or whatever. Certainly things can be from past lives. So if people, for instance, have a lot of neck pain, a lot of headaches, a lot of um, like tight shoulders, upper back, um, have trouble um, just communicating what they want to communicate or might have thyroid issues, can't wear a turtleneck, can't wear a tight necklace, a choker. They typically have some trauma around having been choked, beheaded, um, hung, those sorts of things. And I know that might sound um, grisly or gnarly, but it's okay because I make sure people feel really, really safe. And the point is we're releasing that energy and it can feel so much better um, when they just can say, oh my goodness, we see what happened. We can see why there's some energy there or people can be very afraid of fire. Um, and yes, they've been burned, you know, they were caught in a house fire or they were set on fire or whatever it might be. And again, you're not re-traumatized during the session. It's the opposite. You're releasing it and just letting it go. And also we're not just victims. We have to realize we've been on all sides of the coin because our souls so crave experiences to learn. We have absolutely thrown the torch been the executioner, been the hangman. Um, So let's not um, be in in judgment uh, and blaming, oh my goodness, all these horrible things have been done to me. That's victim mentality. And we need to find our self-empowerment, forgive that, set our boundaries and realize very likely, if you're being very triggered by someone, um, I had a interesting... um, boyfriend I had some very intense um, experiences with and uh, I was reacting uh, poorly to him because I felt like he was uh, overly flirty uh, with other people uh, in my presence and it just it just was presenting for me as as cheater as cheater type of energy uh, heartbreaker type of energy Well, guess what? When you're really being triggered by someone else, uh, yes, look at that, you know, be realistic about it. Um, But look at yourself too. Are you being triggered because you have done those things? 
Mm-hmm. And if you haven't done them in this lifetime, have you done them in other lifetimes? Because that's why he was bringing it up for me. And when I worked with a spiritual numerologist, we discovered I had a lot of karma for being a heartbreaker. So therefore, I needed to meet him and go through those experiences to clean up my energy and to truly apologize uh, and just uh, clean clean that up. Can you share with us some of the spiritual knowledge that you learned from your sessions that changed from what you previously thought? The number one thing that I learned from people is their souls are more magnificent and more kind and more loving and more forgiving than we can ever, ever imagine. They're just also more resilient and more courageous uh, because it's my, it's my privilege to get to witness people going through some pretty challenging, for instance, a uh, recent client um, was leading this pretty idyllic uh, lifetime um, husband, two daughters, and their village was burned to the ground. But being able to release that energy and learn what it was really about and what she was meant to um, learn from that and let go of um, really, really was was pretty, pretty touching. So I think that's the number one thing uh, that I learn is how amazing we all are, but just don't know it and aren't able to find that that self-confidence, find that center, because so many people have tough experiences as children that they're just not able to let go of. And it's a hard job being a parent. It does not come with a manual. Our children teach us, uh, and I just hope that we do our best to rise to the task well, because it is really hard to be a parent. Um, so, and then it's our job as, as adults to let go of, uh, what doesn't serve us, let go of those wounds, um, from, from childhood or the teen years or or earlier in life. That's our job to heal them. It's not our job to blame our parents and, you know, stay in bad relationships. That's, that's not helpful. (laughs) After this life, do we have the option of coming back or and or can we go to other planets or or what are our options? Free will, baby. Mm. <laughs> I really believe in free will that we can we can choose to stay at home. Um, that's another uh, really intriguing thing I learned sometimes is what people's job is when they're at home, not incarnated. And and we can choose to uh, go absolutely to another planet. Um, we can choose to go to other dimensions. That's another big shift over the last year I've been noticing in client past life regressions is more and more people are remembering uh, lifetimes as fairies, mermaids, dolphins, whales in Atlantis, in Lemuria, all these things that may have sounded very fantasy, very fantastical. Uh, Well, my goodness, when we really go through it and they're feeling the emotions and have the specific information and they do better in their life today after finding it, that's a big deal. So um, that, that, that goes on. But again, I love hearing what those jobs are at home too. Mm, Yeah, that would be interesting. All right, Wendy, well, I'm running out of time. So if people want to find out more about you, where should they go? Please go to my website, which is my full name, wendyrosewilliams.com, and you're welcome to request a complimentary uh, 15-minute phone appointment to uh, see how I might be of service to you. You also can find my podcast that I co-host uh, twice a month live. It's the Waking Up Spiritually podcast, and it's at wakingupspiritually.com. And please uh, look for my books on Amazon and Audible. I'm just getting ready to release um, my third book, uh, Regression Healing 2, uh, Joe and Marilyn. All right. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes. Just find a way to trust your intuition. You've got such beautiful 
soul wisdom and knowledge and just find a way to be quiet for just a couple minutes a day. It might be as you're falling asleep or in the shower, or I realize life can be very busy and scheduled, but just, just hear that uh, whisper of your soul and know that you've got those guides that are helping you and your own higher self and intuition and, and just uh, feel the love and support from that. Thank you for that message. And Wendy, thank you for coming back again. I appreciate you and have a great rest of your day. My absolute pleasure, Jeff. Thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing and your great content that people can check out all the wonderful podcasts. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.